America. My name is Amir Yosef Frimpong. Today we're going to talk a little bit about the debate last night between former President Trump and current President Joe Biden. And just a comment that Trump made about immigrants coming over and taking black jobs. Apparently, um, while that's not a sophisticated understanding of what's going on, we can't pretend that that's a stupid claim or that there's no such thing as black jobs. And yet, would you believe no small number of Twitter famous black people are going around and people in the media are going around saying that there's no such thing as black jobs. And that is just a bunch of ignorance. That's almost more dangerous, a quality of ignorance that's almost more dangerous than the quality of xenophobia espoused by Trump's Republican Party. And because there is such a thing as black jobs, and until we understand why there is such a thing as black jobs, <laughs> until, we under, t- until we take occupational segregation seriously and understand that jobs are generational, um, and the legacy of occupational segregation, we will continue to screw up the debate while we show, and, and we screw up the debate by posing as if there's no such thing as legacy racism and that legacy racism doesn't impact the current job market. All right, so let's talk about black jobs. This is from Ira Katz Nelson's When Affirmative Action Was White. The most, important inst- uh, the most important instances concerned categories of work in which blacks were heavily overrepresented, notably farm workers and maids. These groups constituted more than 60% of the black labor force in the 30s and nearly 75% of those who were employed in the South. So 75% of black people who were working in the South in the 30s, that's only, that's grandparents, that's, I mean, my, gra- my grandparents, not even great, my grandparents were alive in the 30s. So, you know, my, my grandfather fought in World War II. So 75% of black people in the South were um, employed in the South were either maids or farm workers, were excluded from uh, Social Security legislation that was passed in the New Deal, Right. And so, and since that legislation created the modern unions and the modern kind of pension systems, that means we're just locked out of functionally the New Deal. This is once again from Ira Katz Nelson, when affirmative action was white. Um, It's kind of a book about how the New Deal created the white middle class and excluded a good number of of black people by design in order to get Southern votes. So until you understand the, the legacy occupational segregation, you don't understand what it means that one, the South is relatively non-unionized, and two, that black people were locked out of other jobs, right? And now those jobs that black people were allowed to do are being disproportionately taken by migrant workers who can send money home so that their little wages are real money back home or are so vulnerable that they're not positioned to organize for better working conditions. So black people will do those jobs, and those jobs are important, but will actually expect to be treated like Americans who are expected to stay in Americans. Other people will come here, do those jobs, and then send money home and build a whole middle class in some other country with their meager wages that they earned here without organizing to get better wages and working conditions. Right? So you can have a very sophisticated and interesting and appropriate conversation about this, or you can pretend that there's no such thing as black jobs, um, And then here's the New York Times from 2018. Op-ed liberals say immigration enforcement is racist, but the group most likely to benefit from it is black men. So the cost of not being honest about what black jobs mean and the effect of immigration on those black jobs is disproportionately uh, borne by black men. So when you say there's no such thing as black jobs, You're saying, I don't care if black men work. (laughs) I don't care if black men work at good wages and working conditions. You've decided that we are to be sacrificed. Because there are black jobs. Black men work them. There's also such a thing as black wealth. And you know what black wealth looks like? It looks like um, having one partner be a nurse and another partner be some sort of law office, law enforcement officer. And they will and them not getting divorced. That's what your black millionaire looks like. That's not necessarily what white millionaires look like, but that's what black millionaires look like. That's what black money looks like because those are two black jobs that have been stably black for long enough that you can get and keep and they're 
quasi-government jobs um, you can get and keep long enough to um, to actually grow if you don't get divorced and don't screw up your family because that's very expensive, right? Those are black jobs, right? Black millionaires are not professors. Black millionaires are not um, construction uh, general contractors. You know, those are anomalies. Those are unicorns. They don't work in HVAC. And we're in the South. So in the South, it's very hot. Half of the HVAC people should be legacy black people. But we were locked out of the industry for so long that only a small fraction, uh, and we live in places where there's heat, so only a small fraction of the legacy HVAC contractors. And these are contractors who do big buildings, not like necessarily home contractors, although not enough of those are white, uh, not enough of those are black either. But legacy ones, the ones who do big buildings, you get those big fat contracts. Not enough of those are black. And I'm sure in my uh, chat, some people are going to say, well, I know a guy or my contractor is black. Yeah, you're a unicorn. You're like pointing to someone who says like, well, I know I know an NBA player and they're a millionaire, which means that black people have money. No, no, you're not talking about black people. You're talking about a black anomaly. And you can't make arguments based on anomalies. You can't make arguments based on anomalies. It's It's lazy. It's dishonest, and you're just posing for whites who you want to be your friend because maybe they'll give you some money. You're just posing, and you're more concerned with posing for those whites who want you to say that there's no such thing as black jobs than you care about the black people working black jobs, right? So I actually care about black people working black jobs, and by the way, if you care about black people working black jobs and you need more people like people like me talking this talk, I need you to go to www.funkyacademic.com and kick in $5.15 or $50 a month so I can keep talking my talk. And, and they'll give the lie to all of those fakers who are trying to tell you that there's no such thing as black jobs. Now, Joanne Reed screwed this up last time when Bernie Sanders was running and he was like, oh, you know, black people are poor. And you know what? We are disproportionately poor. 33%. <laughs> uh, yeah, black people are poor. Forty-four percent home ownership rate. We don't own homes, and if you don't own a home in a land in a capitalist country like in America, if your people don't own homes and your people, all your people are renters, you as a people are not actually making moves in the United States. So forty-four percent, forty-four percent, fifty percent of black people uh, earn less than fifty thousand dollars. And if you know money in major cities where black people live, in cities where black people live, in the urban areas black people live, you know that if you, earn, if you only earn $50,000 in those cities, that means your life is run by the white people in the suburbs who really run that city. Right? Because $50,000 is not enough to make moves. So even if you're saying that, like, well, you know, over half the people make over $50,000, yeah, but half the people make under $50,000. And if that's such at the suck on that community because like those people are the ones who um yeah yeah those people are the ones who are in hock to the whites and need to because the whites pay their meager wages and um you don't have enough money to actually be autonomous in any major even minor metropolitan area at fifty thousand dollars a year you don't have the stakes. If you want to, and since only 44% own houses, um, that means you're saving for a down payment. And if you're saving for a down payment in this economy at $50,000 a year while like maintaining yourself, good luck. Good luck. And with the legacy of occupational segregation, that inheritance isn't going to do what you think it's going to do. It doesn't do what white inheritance does. Um, it doesn't do what white inheritance does. So I don't, I don't know what to tell you, but we need to be honest about the fact of black jobs, that black jobs exist, and that if we don't watch out for immigration, especially if we don't take seriously the idea that people come here to make money to send home where the American dollar is a lot stronger and buys more, so they buy houses there that black people can't buy here working the same jobs while displacing black people here. If we don't take any of that seriously, if you're just posing because you want a Democrat to win or you want to pose for white liberals because you're hoping that maybe white liberals will break you off a little bit of that check, 
um, then you're actually confusing the quality of discourse we need in the nation to make black people whole or at least get black people paid. And if you're not concerned with getting black people paid, black people working black jobs paid, um, then you can't call yourself concerned with community uplift. You can't be for critical race theory and not talk about the fact of black jobs about not talk about occupational segregation and the legacy segregation because jobs are, and skills are handed down in intact families. <laughs> so, um, you know, carpenters come from carpenters, builders come from builders, uh, dentists come from dentists. Like, I, I would not be surprised if your dentist parent was a dentist. Go ask your dentist. How did they learn how to be a dentist? Well, they'll find out that they were <laughs> like um, their uncle were a dentist. And hygienists come from, you know, often dentists. They're the, the, the lady representatives. All right. So we need to be honest about how jobs are passed through families, jobs are passed through cultures, and how, you know, there's a study. I can't place it now. But it says that pretty much the social status of your grandfather is like more predictive of, of anything else. And this actually goes across immigration um, trends. So if your grandfather was like well rep, uh, like well reputed in whatever country you come from, then when you come here, that you'll end up at that same level, that same status. Um, because, well, you know, in a place like India, well, your grandfather was well reputed over there because they were treating <laughs> like the lower caste people like garbage. And so you have generations of knowing how to treat lower caste people like garbage. And that's the same with recent um, East Asian immigrants uh, and, and everything else. So the idea that people come here with nothing. No, they come here with generations of knowing how to treat lower caste people like garbage. And that means something in America, especially when there's such an obvious lower class that will um, that you will be benefited by treating like garbage. So we need to be honest about what legacy segregation, occupational segregation means. We need to be honest about how professions are passed through families. We need to be honest that a lot of our grandfathers were maids and um, uh, farm workers, maids and, and, and service workers, and what that means. What that means that in, in 1968, all of those black men who were doing black jobs uh, collecting garbage in Memphis because two uh, were on strike trying to like show America that they were actually real men, that they were on strike because two black garbage men got killed in a trash compactor. What it means that that was a black job and what their grandparents um, and what their grandkids are doing right now. And it's probably not so well. Right? Well, the whole city of Memphis isn't doing so well for black people. But uh, we need to be honest about what it means that there are such things as black jobs. And then we can talk about, one, how we allow black people to break out of, of occupational segregation, but also the necessary black jobs that are being done. Um, we need to figure out a way to make sure that those are actually... That, people, that the people doing them, that the black people doing them, or anybody doing them, is paid a fair wage with a decent say in their working conditions, right? We don't get anything by pretending that there's no such thing as black jobs. And that is the con. So I am not going to pretend that there's no such thing as black jobs. I will tell you why there is such a thing as black jobs. Occupational segregation. Let me read this again, just in case people are just now seeing this now. The most important instances concern categories of work in which blacks were heavily overrepresented, notably farm workers and maids. These groups constituting more than 60% of the labor force in the 1930s and, ne and nearly 75% of those who were employed in the South. All right? So 75% of the Southern workforces, and there are a lot of Southern blacks, were maids and farm workers, mostly sharecroppers. So what does that mean? We need to actually deal with that, what that means through the legacy, because we haven't broken out of that. Um, because you don't just break out of that by magic. You don't just break out of that by magic. There was a little bit of movement with respect to affirmative action that created more like black cops and, and created black. Uh, and, and, you know, my mom became a nurse because that was just what smart black women did. They, she went to Grady um, Nursing School because at the time, Grady was the school that actually graduated black nurses. 
it was the black nursing school. So like a third of black nurses of my mom's generation went to Grady in Atlanta and went to Grady nursing school there. And like, like the black middle class of that generation worked those jobs. Like it was your black nurse, your black school teacher, your black nurse, your black school teacher, sometimes your black factory worker and your black parole, like parole officer or somehow law enforcement officer. That's what black money looks like. That's what black money looks like. And that, and there is such a thing as black money, but we have to understand that that's what black money looks like. And in a way, that's not real money. <laughs> that's not like... White people inherit more than those people make in 10 years, right? So that is kind of real money at the time, depending. And that's fine money, but we need to organize for those people to be making more money. And um, we need to organize for black people to be in more things than just those things. Just those things. Everybody's most stable black relative shouldn't be a nurse. Everybody's most stable black male relative shouldn't be some form of cop. Right. So um, like that. Yeah. So we need to be honest about what occupational segregation looks like. We need to stop thinking that just because Trump says it means that it can't be true or we can't admit that in some ways it is true and it's not something to be dealt with. Right. So uh, thank you for your time. If you appreciate what I'm doing, go ahead and go to www.funkyacademic.com. And remember, when we lie, when we just say the talking points that the white liberals want to hear, the, dis, like, the people who pay the, pro, uh, the brunt disproportionately are black men. Right? Here's an op-ed from uh, 2018 LA Times. Liberals say immigration enforcement's racist, but the group most likely to benefit from it is black men. We need to be honest about that, what that means. It doesn't mean turn into a xenophobe, but it does mean what like, it does... Uh, it should force us to ask questions about the U.S. economy and what this means. All right, take care, and I will see you next time. Peace.